Welcome to the Executive Lounge with me, Inshira Addo. Your business leadership program that brings you nuggets of insights from the lives and work of men and women who have scaled the daunting heights of either starting their own business or managing institutions uh, both here at home and around the world. My guest today is Mr. Solomon Latte. He is the Managing Director of Activa Insurance Ghana Limited. And he has had sterling experience right here at home and also in the UK. Worked in the mortgage insurance industry. He has worked in the financial sector pretty much all his life. And he brings that wealth of experience to our conversation today. You're welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you, Insure. So, did you always want to do insurance? Not really. <laughs> okay, how, how did we end up in insurance from where we actually wanted to be? Okay, so it stems from my, my background. I come from a very humble home. So, I'm the type who looks for opportunity in everything. Okay. So, when I was in the university, if you asked me what I was going to become after university, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Wow. But I was looking for opportunity in everything. So I studied hard, did my bit. I did some radio mm -hmm. uh, at Radio Universe <laughs> with Black and those guys. That's right. Uh -huh. Then I entered into insurance through um, very mysterious means. Um, after, after national service, I was looking for a job. A friend told me, oh, he had a job at Enterprise Insurance. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, I felt... I was smarter than him. I'm being honest. <laughs> More <laughs> handsome than him. <laughs> I could speak better than him. So how come he got a job at such a nice big company? I said, okay, so then me too, I should be able to get. So introduce me to them. So he introduced me. I went in. They said they had sold all the jobs. So they only had a dispatch job. And I said, okay, then I'll do it. You still took the dispatch job? Yes, okay. with my degree. Mm -hmm. So I took it, I did it for some time. I was falling off the motorbike and, um, you know, <laughs> all those things. But eventually, after getting into the groove, I started taking the insurance courses. So I, I was moved from administration into technical. I started doing insurance. I qualified, went to the UK to continue there, did some work in insurance in the UK and came back. So I didn't plan to be in it, but I was ready for opportunity and that was, that's, that was what came, so I took it. It's quite interesting. I mean, not <laughs> a lot of people would have uh, um, accepted to do a job as a dispatch rider um, with a degree. Um, nowadays, I mean, we have graduates who claim they're unemployed, but then it was rare for a graduate uh, to, 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 to be walking around with a degree and not have a job. But were you, did you have to learn to ride the bike at the time? Very good question, yes. In fact, I was... You took a job without knowing how to ride yes. the bike. I was introduced to the company on a Thursday. That Thursday, they said they needed a dispatcher. So I went back, called everybody I knew that Thursday. I got somebody who had, a, had two bikes. I didn't know him, somebody introduced him to me. I learned to ride that afternoon. And on Friday, Saturday I couldn't, Sunday he went to church, Monday he gave me a bike to go and demonstrate to the people that I could ride. So I went to disgrace myself a bit and the people had mercy on me that yeah, I could ride. <laughs> so wow. that was the beginning. And but they unleashed you on unsuspecting motorists Yes, and when, when I, I oh, they did a lot of the, a good job, you know, because after demonstrating to them that day, they said, okay, come back again. I went again. I went through about three sets of, um, should I say, interview. Mm. Because from that day, they took me to another place called the Piaggio Center. They tested me on um, the road signs and all those mm -hmm. things. Then they took me to the road to try me on the motorbike. I tried it. I, I did it. But then they invited me for another interview. So I came, and at the interview, guess what? The guy who tested me on the riding of the bike was also oh, attending no. the interview. No, he wasn't on the panel. He was coming to, for the interview. Oh, the guy who tested you was yes. actually now competing coming for the job. with you. Yeah. Wow. But at the interview, I got to know that they were looking for somebody who could go out there and help clients complete proposal forms and those mm. kind of things. So it was 
a form of external client services for the company, if you like. So the, we went through the interview, I excelled, and, and, and they took me. And that was the beginning of, an, of the journey here. into insurance. <laughs> so you, you moved um, after a while to the UK and went to Bradford University for your yeah. MBA. Yeah. What was life like in the UK? Oof, another story. That's a seven volume book. <laughs> <laughs> it was very hectic. When mm. I went, I got into the UK, I tried, you know, as a as black, young black man in the UK, you want to do anything just to keep yourself going. I tried any kind of job, I would, they won't take me. I tried cleaning. I remember I went to a Ghanaian who had a cleaning company. He gave me the, that thing. I did the it. The vacuum cleaner yeah, or the, no, the okay. mop. The mop, okay, yeah. I did it. He said, your waste is not good. Wow. <laughs> you can't do this. I, I thought that maybe they felt I was too clean. or I, I don't know, but they said I couldn't clean. I tried security. They wouldn't take me. Every black guy I knew did some security. They wouldn't take me. I went to the till, Tesco, mm -hmm. as the other places, they wouldn't take me. But when I walked into any financial institution, the banks, insurance, they were ready to take me. But I had a restriction. Mm. Because I, was, I went there on a student, on a student visa. visa. You so couldn't I do couldn't, full time and hours. everybody wanted me to do full time. So I struggled until I found smaller companies that needed my skills, but they didn't have, uh, let's say, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So they took me on, and I started from there. The good thing is that in the UK, everyone is regulated. Mm -hmm. So even a small company would have to comply. Yeah. So I was doing general insurance, I was doing claims, <laughs> I was doing compliance, mm -hmm. I was doing mortgages. Okay. For, I worked for two companies there and I, I had to do everything. And that helped in building my knowledge and experience over there. You found yourself in insurance by the off chance of a conversation with a friend whom you were nicer than, <laughs> smarter than, and believed that if he could find a good job, you I could, could do too, better. Right? Um, and then through it all, went to the UK, um, you know, through the tough times, you still managed to find your feet. And, and, and did you think that was preparing you for what you're doing today? <sighs> Not really. Then I was very scared. I was very worried. I had thoughts. I, I believe in God. I'm a Christian. I thought that God had let me down. Wow. But I never stopped moving. My thinking, my ideology in life is just to keep going, no matter what. So I kept going. I was learning everything. And I was looking for opportunity. I was learning things. I had my own business plans that if I had to come to Ghana without a job, I would be able to start something. I had a plan A, B, and C. So I had, I learned, I was writing, making notes anywhere and everywhere. So when I came to Ghana, within two weeks, that was when I got a job to work with Global Alliance Insurance then, which became Activa in 2009. So I came in November, uh, I started searching um, second week in November, first December I started work as operations manager with them. And that's how it's been. So for me, I think it's, uh, it's about attitude and the willingness to learn, the can-do attitude and those kind of things. So. Very interesting. So since 2009, that puts it round about just under... Yeah, let's say... 11 years? 10 years, nine years. Nine years yes. thereabout. Um, well, yeah, because we're in 2018 now. So, in that period, as operations manager, um, did you see a clear path to managing director? Um, I saw the potential. Okay. Because when I joined that company, within three months, I was the senior most person in the company. Okay. Because the um, country manager had to uh, leave, and Activa took over the company. So I was the senior most person. And they asked me if I wanted to be the managing director of the company. And I said, no, I wasn't ready. Because the, well, the company was a French company. And if you look at the vision, we, we wanted to do great things. 
So they asked me if they could bring in somebody who spoke French. And I said, well, I would like to know the person because I'm not ready to work with just anybody. So I, they gave me the name of the person, Stephen Jermatin. I spoke to him on the phone. It was really nice. He spoke very well. I met him. Mm. He, he was nice. And I said, OK, this is the kind of person. I'm. And he had a lot of experience. He had more than 30 years experience in insurance, reinsurance, and other areas, mm. internationally, locally. So that this is somebody I'd like to learn from. So he came in, joined us. We worked, he worked for, well, when he was joining, we said he was supposed to work for like two, three years. He stayed on for seven years. I was ready to learn mm -hmm. from him. So I was just following his footsteps and learning. During that period, I had offers, series of offers from various insurance companies in Ghana to become MD. But I didn't take them for various reasons. One, I thought that I would be going down because I was learning so much. Mm. Activa is an insurance company, an international company. You get to learn from the Swiss Rees, the Munich Rees. You travel to various places, workshops. You meet all kinds of people. If I was going to move, my philosophy is to move to a higher a company that was better than me, mm. not one that will reduce my area of influence. Mm -hmm. So I decided to stay on, continue learning. And um, at the right time, I was, given, I was told, get ready. At the right time, my boss retired. Then I took over. But the thing is, the trick is, he gave me a lot of opportunity as well. He allowed me to do many things. So before, even before I became MD, everybody thought I was the MD. So when I was DMD, you attend programs and they introduced Mr. Latte as MD. And it's a problem because I had to go and explain to my boss that I didn't tell them, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a journey, but it's, it's also a journey of humility and learning over time. How important is um, the relationships that you form over the time, over the period? How has relationships helped you um, reach where you are now? It is very important. The first, that there were different levels. The first was the relationship with my team, the people I'm working with today. And if you ask me today, I'll tell you I have the best team. The management team I have is the best within the insurance industry. And if you look at our figures, you understand what I'm talking about. I, we were one. We were united. We could take walks to go have lunch. We were doing everything together. So we were united. Then, the relationship with my boss, my leader. We, were, we didn't agree on everything, but we never fought. Mm. We could fight with our eyes. And then, but everybody would think everything was OK. We were not the best of friends. We were never friends, but we did our job. And it went well. So, and today, I can still call him if I need something. The third is the board. I have a very solid board with diverse backgrounds, wide experience range. So um, they, they also helped to form me. In fact, they brought, they, they, they've mentored me in many ways. There was a white guy who used to come down from France. He would tell me how, even how to speak in public, many things. So there's a lot of training that went in. And it's all because I probably, I don't know, maybe I demonstrated humility and the willingness, willingness to learn. And so they helped in forming me and bringing me to where I am today. Well, the insurance market is a small one. Um, but you said that you, know, you, you, you look for opportunity in every situation. Where do you think the silver lining uh, <laughs> is in, in this industry? Great question, yeah. Um, it's a small one. And if you look at insurance in Ghana, insurance penetration in Ghana is less than 2%. Mm -hmm. It's about, recently it was about 1.3%. 2015 was around 1.7. So there, it means that there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of room. What the industry is doing now is that every company is fighting for the same cake. Mm -hmm. So a small one at a that. small one. <laughs> but there's a lot out there that we haven't tapped. Right. The problem is it's not easy. This is Ghana. 
in Ghana, we have our own forms of insurance culturally. Mm -hmm. We have a NOBWA, we have extended family systems that support us. So you don't really need to pay for that kind of support when something bad happens. You know? but then, so that understanding is not there. It's very difficult mm. to sell it. But I believe that with the coming in of microfinance, microinsurance, and the uh, formalization of the informal sector, mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity for growth in the insurance industry. Well, now elsewhere, the insurance market, not just in terms of size, but also influence and impact on the economy is massive. Um, at 1.3 or even at a generous 2% penetration and, and market coverage in Ghana, um, we're still playing, you know, but we have about 49 or so, if you combine life in general, um, companies in this space. Isn't it too crowded? <laughs> Ah, that's not for me to say. <laughs> but I think, I think yes, um, there's some room for consolidation. I think that the industry needs to, to, to grow. Last time I spoke at a place and I mentioned that we need to, government or the system would have to deliberately create mega insurance companies. Because you refer to other places, and the thing is that we need to have insurance companies that have the muscle to, to establish banks, yeah. real estate, many things. In India, 2% of their, the, the, the money that they use for infrastructure development comes from insurance. Wow. So insurance can do so many things for the economy. And if, if, the, if we want to benefit Proper, proper, pro properly from insurance, mm -hmm. then there, there must be a deliberate attempt to grow the sector, to grow mega insurance companies in the, in, in the country. I know that your question is coming at the backdrop of the banking industry shakeup mm -hmm. that we are seeing that we, 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 uh, many banks had to go down, probably also because there's an increase in capital requirement. In Ghana today, the capital requirement for insurance is only 15 million. Ghana cities. But insurance, insurance companies are required to, cap, to cover, provide protection for mega companies, for the Nestle's, for the Gassem's, for, for the mining companies, even for oil. But you're only required to show that you have 15 million. Exactly. So if we put all the insurance companies together and there's an oil risk, we are only able to provide less than 5% of the protection needed in Ghana for oil business, which means that all the insurance money would go out. And I've seen that people have been talking about insurance companies sending risks out of the, out of the Ghanaian market. It's like that because we don't have capacity. In insurance, you need technical capacity and financial capacity. If you don't have the financial capacity, how can you retain risks? You know, so, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that should happen, mm -hmm. okay? I think that over time, I, I, I know the new, the new Commissioner of Insurance mentioned that he was going to increase the minimum capital requirements for insurance companies. It might go up to about 45 million. Exactly. Will that be adequate? It's a start. If you move from, and you know, certain companies will definitely suffer because if you're moving from um, 15 million to 45, that's so about three times. Yeah, 300 percent. So, um, but if that's the way they want to go, it means that companies would have to start talking to each other and begin to consolidate. You don't wait for the regulator to come and shut you down. You know, so for me, if, if it, they want to do it, it's, it's a welcoming news because we need to um, grow the sector. Mm. But there's a caveat to it. There's another side to it. The other side is that there are different risks that companies are exposed to. So if an insurance company wants to concentrate on large businesses, like what we do in Activa, corporates, huge accounts, then you must, from my standpoint, you must have adequate capital to cover those. If you want to play in the micro insurance sector, where you are covering market women, small risks, 
where if there's a loss, you only pay maybe a thousand Ghana cities and those kind of things. Then I'm thinking that they should make it such a way that you can have capital that can meet that kind of. So they have to, for me, I think they should grade it. They should graduate it. Okay. So that you have maybe a tiered approach where those who, you, you, so the license will now have to be tiered. Exactly. So that those you, who your want license to. license allows you to play in a certain field. Exactly. And you can't go outside of that threshold. Exactly. I think Nigeria is starting that. Okay. Interesting. Well, we're going to explore more of your thoughts in a moment. Uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll be talking and learning more from Mr. Solomon Lati, the Managing Director of Active Insurance, Ghana Limited. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. I'm in Shira Addo and my guest today is Mr. Solomon Latte, Managing Director of Activa Insurance Ghana Limited. We've learned quite a lot uh, already and uh, looking forward to some more. You talked about the cohesion um, with your team. Um, and you talked about the board. We'll explore that in a bit. But more importantly, the team at the management level. How important is that kind of togetherness to drive a business vision uh, and, and its impact on the people that make up the rest of the organization? Okay, that's good. It's, 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 it's a fine line mm. that you have to tread. You should be very close, united. Mm -hmm. You should be nice, but you should also be firm. So you have to be able to balance the two because you have an executive team and you still have to supervise them. And then you have to find ways of getting the best out of them. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of things. Um, I, um, I do it by listening. So we run an open door policy. Anybody can walk in at any time and discuss issues with you. We have regular meetings as well. And, but through that, they get to know your vision. They know where you are going, and then you get them to come along. You are truthful and transparent. You don't talk behind anybody's back. So you don't hold meetings behind, unless the person seeks permission that I can't be there. So even when that person comes back, you should be able to tell them what was discussed. You know? So on that score, that's how uh, we go about it. Um, we are instituting a mentorship program that will allow various leaders to be able to mentor the general staff, bring them up. Because we realize that sometimes young people make mistakes in life and it's because they don't know. Mm. They leave a good company that has a future to go and chase a few because somebody comes and says, um, offering you double your salary. Sometimes they don't consider anything. It's all about the money. They just go and they mess up. But in leadership, sometimes you identify people with the potential and try to nurture them. One, one thing that we do is that we, we think, good, it's good to have CSR. Go out there and be nice to people. But we also have a form of internal, internal CSR where we train the people very well give them exposure. So at any level, they are better than what a competitor, for instance, will, a competitor, a competitor at the same level mm -hmm. would be. Mm -hmm. you know? So, so it's, it's tricky, but it, that's why you are called into leadership, you know, to management. And I realized that, I'm just chipping this in, in Africa, most of the time we have had managers rather than leaders. Mm. And if you want a company to do very well in our current dispensation where we realize you, you, you see a, a, a growth mm -hmm. in the middle class, the millennials, it means that you should be a leader to be able to carry them along. Otherwise, they are just moving, mm. you know, so. That's Interesting. Awesome. We'll explore. Um, you know, at what point a business needs a manager and what point a business would need a leader in a moment. But um, in your experience, what do you think kills companies? And, and, and let me extend that a little bit against the backdrop of 
the fact that it's not just the mission and the vision of a business that makes it run or the strategy, but it's really the culture, which is the fulcrum around which uh, the business can thrive. Right. What are the top culture killers in your experience? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> I think that um, for me, the first thing for an organization is systems. You should have systems because your, the culture of the firm or the organization would evolve around the kind of systems you have. Mm. If you don't have systems and systematic ways of doing things, and you do things in, a, in an ad hoc way, you won't have a proper... It means your culture mm -hmm. is ad hoc, so you can't do things right. So the first thing we do is to have effective systems. Of course, we also have very strong corporate um, corporate governance principles that we stick to. Of course, if it's an international organization, there's a group structure, you have to stick to corporate governance. So um, those are the main things. Then beyond that, bring it, it down, we use systems. You have a, a, a staff manual, and a writing manual, reinsurance guidelines. There are guidelines to do everything, and then people will have to go through that. So uh, I, I would say, it's systems that we use to manage those things. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you're, you can have a vision, you can have a, uh, a good uh, policy or product. You won't be able to bring it out because your people cannot follow you. And so the thing that kills companies, first of all, if you don't have a good corporate governance principle, you, you would go down. If you don't have systems and the right kind of leadership, the MD can be the best in the world. If the, if the midfield is no good, forget it. And then the defense. Mm -hmm. If you have claims people who are forging claims and condoning and conniving with people, then you will have leakages. So it's a whole um, structure and an orientation to do what is right. But I'm excited that top. you said orientation because you see, um, you can have all of these rules written and laid down with a clear definition of where the rewards and uh, retribution will come from if you flout these laws or rules. However, um, the orientation of a man's mind or a woman's mind is something that is very difficult yeah. uh, to mold. How are you able to pick people and ensure that irrespective of their individual backgrounds and uh, natural tendencies or proclivities, they are able to fit in this space and work properly. Okay. So it starts from the interview phase, the selection. Um, elsewhere, they have systems where you go through psychometric evaluation, mm -hmm. various forms of evaluation to tell what kind of person you are before they take you on. We, we have basic systems we use. It's not as advanced as, as other countries have, but we have that. And then what the HR does, so they do the first level of selection. You come to the interviews, we look at you, and then we orient you. For me, I remember there was a gentleman who came for an interview. He had jumped companies. He had been in three companies in five years. And I, but I liked him. He was so good. And I spoke to him and I told him, look, ideally, I won't take you because you're a mercenary. But Probably you're a mercenary because you haven't found your station yet. Mm -hmm. You haven't found that company that meets you or offers you exactly, uh, give you, give, gives you the opportunity to be who you are. Mm -hmm. you know, so, but I'm ready to mentor you mm -hmm. to get the best, to, to help you give up your best. Because true, you are, you are a very good marketer, but I can see that you are shallow. I told him exactly what I thought of him. He went back, he virtually broke down. He came back the following day and told me that, look, even if I didn't give him the job, he was happy he met me because I had told him the truth about himself. And he's, if I decide to give him the job, he's, he was assuring me he was going to give off his best. I took him, he's working, he's doing fantastic things now, he's relaxed. In fact, he got married recently, so now he's a, he's a man, mm -hmm. you know. So there are many ways, but you start from the interview phase, and then when they come in, the kind of mentorship, the training, 
that you give them. And leadership by example, what do you, you do? Because you don't say one thing and go and do something else. So what do you do to show them that, yes, if you go this way, this way you get to? Uh, they all help. Management, leadership. Um, there's this new evolution that we, we need more leaders than managers. Um, but business is about management. Um, at what point do you draw the distinction between management and leadership? Or do you run them side by side? What, what tells them apart? Okay. Let me take it this way. So the higher you go, the more of a leader you need to become. If you are down there, you are told what to do. A, B, C, D, and you follow, you told that line. As you become middle management, you manage. So there's a leader who is visionary, who is seeing the future, who is plotting the graphs and planning what should be done. In the middle, you, he, the, um, the leader, the board, they've thought through what should be done yeah. and asked you to execute. So when it gets to your level, you manage it. You execute what you've been told to do in line with laid down rules and regulations. Mm. Okay, so you're a manager. As you go up, you become both a manager and a leader. Because now you have to manage what you have been told to do. For instance, you are giving a target and a budget to work with. You need to achieve your target, mm -hmm. but you need to work within budget. So you manage what you have. Okay. But you also have to manage people. The, you, have to, you have to manage the people that are working under you. You have to manage the people that are above you. You have to manage your peers. The only way you can do that is by showing leadership um, mm -hmm. to the people who are following you. Mm -hmm. Leadership is about going, to, going places and taking people along with you. Okay. So you have to have that ability to convince your team, mm -hmm. sh show them where you are going, and um, let, get them to appreciate the fact that where you are going is the right way to go. So there's marketing in, in there, there, there's a whole lot of things, mm -hmm. customer service, human relations, philosophy, psychology, all those things in there. You, you, and then you educate them and get them to follow you. So my simple answer to that is that the higher you go, the more of a leader you need to become. If so you, you start with management yes, and evolve into leadership. Yes, but at that level, it's a combination. Of the two. Yeah, but there's more of leadership up there. Because if you are appointed as a CEO, your job is to is a leadership job. Mm. You are supposed to lead the group to achieve the goals of the company. You are not necessarily going to be the one doing. You are leading. So that's how it is. The let's take a pyramid as the as the um, a structure. A structure. So the, the CEO obviously at the top, or the managing director at the top, you've got your middle managers, and then the broad base is the rest of the organization. It's often said that you know, leadership is cause everything else is effect. How does management or the leadership of an organization structured such as that ensure that there's no disconnect? So you have great vision, you have a middle management that's supposed to now channel that great vision into tasks that people then do and deliver on the overall target and, 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 and dream. But somehow you are way up at the top and there's a disconnect. How do you ensure that you see right down the chain? Okay, that's a very good question. So there are different kinds of management styles. Mm -hmm. You can have a hierarchical structure or a flat structure. Each one has its own advantages and disadvantages. If you take um, a hierarchical structure, it means that you are going to see what is happening down there through other people. I don't believe in that. I believe in a flat structure, such that the reporting lines are limited, are reduced to the barest minimum, so that anybody else can get, you can get information from other people. And you see, to be, that's why I said um, management, uh, it's about leadership. Mm -hmm. You need to gather information from every level. There are times I go to the shop floor, I go and sit on 
at the reception, for instance, and do a few things there. Someone comes in and you, you act as a receptionist and they are surprised that you are there. You have to feel what everybody does mm. along with. I can say that, okay, I've gone through the meal. I started from dispatch. I went through everything mm -hmm. to get to the top, so I know. But knowledge evolves and you need people to tell you about new experiences and all those things. And sometimes, as, as information travels up, it gets sifted, it gets changed. So you might get you some... it gets filtered. <laughs> exactly. Distilled. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, gets, it changes. So you'll get something that might not be exactly as pure as it is. So for me, I think that best, the best way to manage an organization is flat. However, it depends on the nature of the business. Could an organization be run with a hierarchical management structure on paper, but in practice, in terms of the culture, that you have a very flat um, uh, approach? Um, it's not the best. If you have a hierarchical structure, you have to respect it. But the leadership of whoever is at the helm of affairs can help him get information right. from wherever he wants. So he can have access, he can have it. But the thing is, for me, if I have a leader, if I'm, let's say, a, a deputy manager, and I have a manager through whom I report to the boss, I would never bypass him and get to you. Mm. So if it's a hierarchical structure, I will go through the process. Unless something is going extremely wrong. Even that, there are various aspects, uh, there are various units within the organization that you should use to address your grievances. That's right. So I'll go through that. So you won't get it that way. But if it's a flat structured organization, then of course you have very uh, limited reporting lines and through that. So it depends on the leader. You know, the financial services sector of our economy is small, uh, even if you throw the banks in there together. Um, and it's a specialist space. So the attrition that businesses see is, is actually quite a, a cycle. So you kind of have the same crop of people moving <laughs> around mm -hmm. the same industry. Mm -hmm. How do you keep people staying on and sticking around? I think that what I experienced is that our leaders had not been leaders. The best leader is the one who should be, and that this I learned from my former MD. Mm -hmm. The best leader is the one who, sh who, who should be able to step out of the office, step away from the office, and the office would run as if he's still there. So they can run on their own. So you have to have a good succession plan. You have to mentor people, you have to train people, educate people, and bring people to that level. And then information, Mm -hmm. You have to have a way to get information filtered into the organization as quickly as possible. Once you have that, you get the people to feel a part of the organization. They belong. Mm -hmm. Where credit is due, you give. Mm -hmm. When people do well, you acknowledge and appreciate them. I've worked at a place where I had made suggestions and it had been implemented and I was not recognized. So I left. But if somebody does something and you recognize them, they are happy. Mm. Okay, so there are, it's, a, it's a combination of things, but the, the thing is you should be able to um, appreciate them and train them and make them a part of the organization. Then, of course, they will stay. But beyond that, it's not everybody who will still stay anyway. Mm -hmm because there are new companies coming, people have more money to offer. To offer. Uh, sometimes a person has special needs that they need to take care of. They, mm -hmm. they, they have other skills they need to explore. There are so many reasons. Mm -hmm. So when, when it's time for them to leave, you bless them and, and they leave. There's a great guy in the, in, in the media right now who used to work with me. Mm. He, was, he was very good. But it got to a point and I called him and I told him, hey, this is your time. You have to follow your passion. He was one of my best employees, but I had to let him go. And I told him, go and do this because you are good at it and you will excel. We sat down, we strategized, he left. 
He's doing marvelously well. You know him. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing marvelously well. Wherever he sees me, yeah. he'll come to me. You understand? But that's leadership. You, are, you, you have to. You, leadership is not only about getting your company to do well, but it's also about developing people. other people. Then they feel indebted to you somehow or to the organization, or they feel that they are a part of your success story wherever they find themselves. Great stuff. We're going to take our final break, and uh, when we come back, uh, we'll be talking and learning some more about life at Accra Academy uh, <laughs> from Mr. Solomon uh, Latte, who is our guest today, and the Managing Director of Active Insurance Ghana Limited. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. I'm in Shirado and uh, my guest today is Solomon Latte. He's the Managing Director of Activa Insurance Ghana Limited. Life at Accra Academy. I promised we were going to learn about that. Um, were you up to mischief <laughs> while you were there? <laughs> what was it like, you know, um, in an all-boy secondary school? I was a very good boy mm. in Accra Academy. I was very quiet. Okay, okay, I take that back. I was a cool guy. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was quiet. And I didn't do many things. I just went to school, studied, and went home. The time, the little time I tried to venture out of my comfort zone, I, I tried football in the mm -hmm. school. And I was a goalkeeper. I remember one, one much. One person scored five times against me, so I left the pitch and I said, I won't play football again. And that oh. was the end. But you don't come across <laughs> as someone who gives up when, when, when they don't do well. Okay. That's the, that's the thing. I, I wouldn't start something I'm, I'm not good at. If I can't do it, I won't do it. Okay. But once I try to, if I, if I decide to do it, I'll do it. As for football, I just stumbled into it. And I said, oh, <laughs> my brother is a very good footballer. Let me just try something. Uh, I thought I, could, to see if yeah, I, thought I was a good goalkeeper. <laughs> I tried it, and it was a complete failure. So I didn't try again. Wow. But I like dancing. You like dancing. <laughs> so did you, that means, uh, oh, well, let me just find out, uh, rather, uh, if you like dancing, uh, did you go across the road to Collegono every once in a while? <laughs> no. Um, you never went to St. Mary's? No. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> I knew some people from St. Mary's. <laughs> you knew some people, from, but you never went there? No. Okay. You know, but um, how do you think um, your secondary education shaped you um, for the future, for university, for life in the UK? and eventually running a, a big insurance company? Hmm, that's a good one. Um, secondary education, the, what would I say? I'll say that it's, it's rather laid the foundation. I started primary school, I, had, I never attended any good school. I, um, my, I, I need to chip this in. My first contact with education was with an old woman who put a few kids together and we will, she will rally us around the market singing yeah yeah school more fra yeah pe um pe si everybody could do me <laughs> so we ran to the market they would donate things we come and she'll cook for us we eat then that was my first contact i went i didn't go to any good school i went to that school was called uh, abrewa school then I went to Auntie Day School. The names of the schools should tell you the kind of schools I went mm. to. Then I went to uh, Odoko 2 and 3 Primary School, which was a school under tree. Then I went to Agbodon School for junior secondary. Mm -hmm. Then I went to, of course, Bleo, which is Accra Academy. So that was, Accra Academy was the first time I came in contact with a proper educational, educational institution. So I gave it my all. I was studying any time, morning, night. And my, understand, my philosophy about life is that there's nothing like a bad experience. Mm. You, can, you, you have to get the positive side of the situation. So for instance, if you punished me in school and you asked me to go and weed, my thinking is that I'm, I'm exercising. 
So as I'm throwing the thing, I'm exercising, my hands, I weed and I realize that I'm getting blisters. Mm -hmm. It means that my, my, my hands are not strong enough, so I should be doing more of those. That's my thinking. So when there's no light, I think that I should, it's an opportunity for me to experience the use of a candle to study. Okay, so that's, that's how, but so those were the main things I picked up mm. from Accra Academy. I wasn't the best student there, but I, I, gave my, I always give myself a chance. I did my best. Um, at the end of the, um, my time there, mm -hmm. final, when our results, final results came. So this was A-level? No, I did SS, first batch. Oh, okay. SS, we were the first batch of the SS people. When our results came, even though, you know, from form one to three, we, we were the first batch, so we, we did three years. Mm -hmm. from, one, from, from one to three, I never received any award but I had colleagues who received awards. When I got to um, the final year, I was one of the best students who did well in our final examination. Mm. Okay. So um, there are people like that. So in Accra Academy, I didn't really do much. I wasn't a uh, sportsman for the school. I, didn't, I wasn't a, a, a speech person like speech and prize giving day <laughs> I was, I was, I was just in between right but it gave me the foundation because when I went to the university it was the foundation I had had that spurred me on to become today. were you at any point in time I mean so you're arriving in a secondary school there were people coming from all over in schools of some repute um, at the junior high school level, you're meeting people who may have gone to some good uh, schools. Good schools. Um, how did you feel whenever you related to these people? Were you ever, did you ever feel inferior? Did you ever feel that they were better than you? Never. I went to a very good school, so I, I felt very proud. Accra Academy guys are very loud, so <laughs> I was very loud. In fact, the first day I went to university, I had a guy who brought a certain rickety car to come and drop me. And the sad part of it is when he got to the, I was at the Republic of Okbomulu in the University of okay. Ghana, boys. Mm -hmm. Then it was all boys. When he got to the field, he started blowing a siren. <laughs> so people would come and see <laughs> who, who has arrived, <laughs> you know? So, and I came, I didn't know. That was my first time being in a boarding situation, so I came with a, a chop box and um, a trunk. And you can imagine what happens in a university, <laughs> in a boys' place when you bring a, a trunk. So everybody started shouting. They brought their things, <laughs> made a lot of noise. My, the landlord there came to my room poured water on the floor, asked me to swim in it, <laughs> he gave me the trunk to carry it <laughs> all over the place. So it was, if, it, if it was today, it would have gone viral on social yeah. media. King Solomon in a swimming pool. You know <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, we did that. He, 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 they did all that. But I never felt inferior. Mm. I, was, I, was, I knew I, was, I had something. So, and, and I explored it, and it worked for me. Fantastic. Well, this is all time would allow us, and uh, I would greatly appreciate your time and your openness uh, sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Five things I'm taking away from this conversation. Number one, misfortune. Whether you like it or not, has a fortune in it. And uh, you just have to keep looking for the opportunities in every situation you come across. And number two, that life prepares you. So every single day prepares you for the next. Uh, the experiences you go through, the things that you experience, the places you see, uh, your upbringing, be it whether you went to Antide or Agbodon, the future is what you make it. Uh, number three is that you must apply yourself. It's not where you find yourself that makes the difference. It's what you do with yourself that makes the difference. Uh, number four is that um, build great relationships uh, with people who will make you better, people who will challenge you, people who will uh, be accountability partners of yours that will hold you, uh, you know, accountable and have a 
a proper yardstick to measure your effort and output. Uh, and number four is that as you go through life, take someone along. Each one, teach one. Uh, it's been a wonderful time uh, talking to you. And I look forward to seeing you again on the Executive Lounge. Again, thank you for watching. And we'll be back another time. My name is Inshirado. As always, go forward, make rain. Shalom.